The Bab was a revolutionary prophet. His life was marked by drama and intrigue and tens of thousands of people following him. The Bab, I think, is someone who is engaging in intimacy and ecstasy with the divine at a very deep level. People fell under his influence to the point of being willing to sacrifice his life for him and his ideas. Someone with that sort of influence over the masses of people was perceived as a threat. It was politically disruptive to have a new religion appear. You have to execute him. 750 soldiers shot. And when the smoke cleared, the bob had vanished. All major religions have prophecies of a promised one who will usher in a golden age. The Messiah, the return of Christ, the 10th Avatar, and the 12th Imam. Today, many have put aside these prophecies, never imagining that they could come true, especially in their own lifetime. But this was not always so. Less than 200 years ago, People all over the world experienced an intense and immediate expectation of a promised one. Major world religions, such as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, were each independently identifying the same time period, the mid-19th century, for the appearance of their promised one. In England, France, Germany, Holland, Sweden, and other countries, Christians were actively waiting to receive the fulfillment of prophecies that they were convinced were imminent. In the early 19th century, uh, especially for Protestants in America, there was a lot of religious fervor. Revivals were being preached in churches, out in the fields. And in these revivals, people were hearing that Jesus Christ would return again and that the world would be purified by fire. At that time, a man named William Miller became convinced that the second coming, or second advent of Jesus Christ, could be calculated to the day and set out to prove it. William Miller went through the Bible meticulously and he matched historic events that had already happened with prophecies in the, both the Old and the New Testaments. And to his great surprise, he discovered, first of all, the first advent was there, prophesied in the Old Testament, and then that the second advent was coming. He compared the prophecies with actual historical events uh, that seemed to fulfill prophetic uh, promises and computed very rationally the date when all the prophecies would be fulfilled. Thousands of people believed that Miller was right and flocked to what became the American Adventist movement convinced that Jesus Christ would return on a specific day in 1844. One can imagine the heightened expectation of people, both the excitement and the fear of what was coming. The farmers stopped farming their fields. They didn't do the harvest. Some people uh, confessed to crimes so that they wouldn't have the crimes on their conscience when Jesus came. People who drank gave up alcohol, People really changed the way of living, ready for this fantastic moment. On October 22nd, 1844, 100,000 followers gathered together in churches, homes, and fields in anticipation of the promised arrival of Jesus Christ. Well, when the sun came up on October 23rd, they had to confess to themselves that nothing happened. It was terrible. It was really terrible. They were completely distraught and weeping. The day became known around the world as the Great Disappointment. What I find fascinating 
is that a similar thing was happening in Persia amongst the Shia Muslims. And extraordinarily enough, the year that they were looking at in their calendar was 1260, which is 1844 in our calendar. While Christians in the West were awaiting the return of Christ in 1844, at the same time in the East, Shia Muslims also awaited a divine messenger under a different name, the 12th Imam. They believe that he was in a state of physical concealment. He was alive and present, but he simply could not be seen. They imagined that this thousand-year-old person would return to the world as an agent of God to bring peace. That he would use the sword to become a political leader and rule over the world with justice. Every Shi'i in mid-19th century Iran, of course, had to believe this. Some of them, perhaps, hoped it would never happen because it would be a great shakeup, according to the prophecies in, in the Shi'i holy books. Things would be turned upside down. It wouldn't be business as usual when the hidden imam comes back. Yes, justice would be established, but uh, many things would change. The Orthodox religious and political leaders of Persia, while they paid lip service to the long-for advent of the 12th imam, they well knew that his arrival would signal the end of their power. On the one hand, they have to constantly show reverence towards the 12 Imam. On the other hand, any person, any movement, which in any form or shape makes a claim of being that millenarian realization, they would fight it with all their power and might. One of the Shia Muslims who had been waiting for the 12th Imam in the years before 1844 was a religious scholar named Sheikh Ahmad. He led an independent movement of followers known as the Sheikhis in Persia and Iraq. Sheikh Ahmad gathered around himself students and disciples to prepare the people for the appearance of the Promised One. The growing Sheikhi movement was a direct threat to the traditional clerics. Despite being persecuted, the Sheikhis' innovative and original teachings continued to attract followers. One of these followers was a brilliant scholar named Sayyid Kazem. He succeeded Sheikh Ahmad and greatly advanced the movement in Karbala. But Sayyid Kazem died without naming a successor. Prior to his passing, Sayyid Kazem urged his students to do nothing but to scatter in search of the Promised One, whose appearance was imminent. Another Sheikhi of great significance was a religious cleric named Mullah Hussein. He returned from a special mission to find that Sayyid Kazem had passed. Mullah Hussein returned to Karbala and he inquired as to what Sayyid Kazem's final instructions had been to them. What were his last wishes? And to his amazement, he heard that Sayyid Kazem had stated very clearly to them that upon his passing, they were to do nothing but to scatter in search of the Promised One. Why are you still here? In anger, he turned to his fellow Sheikhis, imploring them to do as Sayyid Kazem had demanded. Mullah Hussein and a few others determined to carry out their late teacher's dying wish to find the Promised One. He retired to a mosque for 40 days of prayer. Sayyid Kazem had told Mullah Hussein that he would know the Promised One when he delivered, without being asked to do so, a commentary on a chapter of the Quran known as the Surah of Joseph. As if by a magnet, Mullah Hussein says, he is attracted to the city of Shiraz. And there, in Shiraz, something happened that would reverberate across the world. Mullah Hussein arrived on May 22nd, 1844, and soon noticed a striking young man who wore a green turban, signifying sacred lineage as a descendant of Muhammad. This young man approached him and greeted him so warmly and with such courtesy and such dignity and asked him if he would be a guest in his home. Mullah Hussein was surprised, but accepted the young man's invitation. As they approached the entrance to his home, the youth recited these words. 
enter therein in peace, secure. After the two men shared refreshments, it was time for evening prayers. I have striven with all my soul. With the youth by his side, Mullah Hussein prayed to God that he had so far failed in his quest to find the Promised One. But he reaffirmed his conviction that God's promise faileth not. He was so focused on his mission that initially he failed to comprehend that the object of his quest was sitting right next to him. After prayers, Mullah Hussein sought to excuse himself. But his host urged him to remain and began questioning him about the prophecies of the 12th Imam. The young man asks Mullah Hussein, in what way did your master, Sayyid Qazim, describe the Promised One? The Promised One would be between the ages of 20 and 30. He would be of pure lineage, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. He would be completely bereft of any bodily deficiencies, and he would possess innate knowledge. The youth listened to Mullah Hussein's description of the Promised One, and then he said, Behold, all these signs are manifest in me. And Mullah Hussein was somewhat taken aback by this. He was a, a young man who, who was, wasn't even one of the learned class. He was a merchant, and yet he was making these claims. He's faced with this dilemma, could this be? But there was a hesitation because of how weighty this responsibility was, and he began to remember all the things that his teacher had told him about, the magnificence, the power, the knowledge of this individual. Then, without being prompted, the youth asserted, now is the time to reveal the commentary on the Surah of Joseph. This was the definitive sign Mullah Hussein was waiting for that it would come from someone who is not trained in the religious sciences and come so automatically like that, out of the blue, must have been overwhelming. Thrilled by the beauty and rapidity of his revelation, Mullah Hussein listened as the youth declared that he was the Bab, meaning the gate, sent by God to usher in a new age for mankind and herald another prophet even greater than he. This was an astounding moment for Mullah Hussein, who found himself realizing that he was indeed in the presence of the Promised One. Throughout the ages, God has sent many divine messengers, Krishna, Abraham, Moses, Zoroaster, Buddha, Jesus Christ, and Muhammad. The arrival of the Bab and his ideas of progressive revelation mark a dramatic departure from traditional Islamic teaching. Traditional Islamic belief has it that Muhammad is the last prophet, so revelation has come to a close, and this will last until the day of resurrection when the world will come to an end. So they had this fixed and unchanging view of religion as opposed to the Bab's uh, view of religion as an evolution of God's will throughout human history taking humanity forward. God progressively reveals truth and religion, spiritual guidance to humanity, and that guidance is given to us by teachers or prophets that appear to humankind at different moments in history who bring teachings that build on each other, are consistent with each other, but are relevant to that time and that culture and that place in which they are given. Somehow the concept of progressive revelation that religion renews itself, that no religion is final. This became a threat to the clergies in all religions. Persia, known today as Iran, is home to one of the oldest continuous civilizations on Earth and is considered one of the first great empires. When Islam swept through the region, Persia emerged as a center of the Islamic Golden Age, contributing significant culture, scholarship, and science to the world. But by the appearance of the Bab in the 19th century, Persia was in serious decline. They were suffering from a military defeat against Russia, so they were suffering economically. Poverty was widespread. The wars 
had been supported by the clerics, stating that it was incumbent upon them as a religious responsibility to engage in battle against these atheists from Russia. Naturally, it was expected that they would be victorious because they were fighting on the side of God. When they were not, when they suffered defeat, it was humiliating. There was anarchy in parts of the country. And on the other hand, you had power-hungry religious clerics that were challenging the state's authority. And the ordinary people were sort of crushed in between these two powers. It was a depressing condition of a country that once upon a time was great and now was brought down very low. It was in this environment that Sayed Ali Muhammad, who would become known as the Bab, was born on October 20th, 1819 in Shiraz, Persia. He was a descendant of Abraham and he was also a descendant of Muhammad, which gave him revered status in society. After his father died at a young age, he was raised by his mother and his uncle. He was receiving an education, but the teacher told his uncle that he didn't need to go to school to receive an education because he seemed to have such innate knowledge. At the age of 15, the Bob went to work in his uncle's textile business in the port city of Bushir. He was known for his honesty. He was known for his spirituality. He spent lots of time in prayer. When he was 20, he traveled to Karbala, Iraq, a city held sacred by Shia Muslims. At this time, Karbala is the center of the highest intellectual developments in the world of Shia Islam, which was the Sheikhi movement. The Bab met a number of these disciples of uh, Sayyid Qazem. And the Bab, in fact, sat on some of Sayyid Qazem's classes. The Bab's time in Karbala lasted less than a year, after which he returned to Shiraz. There, he soon married his childhood friend, Khadija Bagoon. Late one night, after noticing that the Bab had left their bed, she went looking for him and saw the upper chamber of their house was immersed in light. She later wrote, his face was luminous, rays of light radiated from it. He looked so majestic and resplendent that fear seized me and I stood transfixed where I was. The next morning, the Bob confirmed that she had witnessed his actual moment of revelation. He told her, it was the will of God that you should have seen me in the way you did last night, so that no shadow of doubt should ever cross your mind. So a messenger of God can be thought of as God made manifest in human flesh. A human being, yes, but also a specially appointed divine teacher with perfect spiritual attributes reflecting the light of God and giving God's message to humanity for that day and age. During the summer of 1844, 17 more people became the first followers of the Bab. In many ways, these followers were like the 12 apostles of Christ. Prominent among them was the youngest disciple, Caduce. And these were individuals that needed to discover the Bab on their own through the purity of their own hearts and their own intentions. And so that itself was a very intriguing and mysterious process guided by spiritual intuition and a sincere desire for spiritual search on behalf of all of those individuals and many, many more. The original disciples of the Bab were called the Letters of the Living. This symbolized the building blocks to the new revelation, that these letters went out and they promoted the word of the living God. The Bab dispatched his disciples throughout Persia and Iraq to proclaim the coming of the new revelation. The people were expecting the return of the 12th Imam, but the message delivered by him was radically different. The message they spread was that all people and all things come from the same creator and are sacred, beautiful, and worthy of respect. It didn't matter if you were a king or a goat herder in the eyes of God. 
External traits such as race, gender, and nationality are not the true human reality. Instead, each of us are like mirrors reflecting the light of God's revelation. The message of the Bob was a charismatic message, it was a creative message, and it was well received by the society. He reinvigorated the process of religion itself. He taught the purity of religious faith and devotion, that you could pray from your heart, that you could find the truth for yourself. And this was inspiring to the masses. He did what other prophets have done in the past, which is to reveal his claims gradually, because to put forward his full claims immediately would be too shocking for the people of Iran. One of the most significant and dangerous teachings of the Bab was that each person could have their own relationship with God without the direction, mediation, or intercession of a cleric. And in town after town, his disciples found receptive listeners. Historians report that thousands of people accepted the Bab's claims and teachings. In a short period of time, the Babi movement was a significant uh, social movement, spiritual movement in Iran that both the clerics and the state became extremely worried about it. Religious clerics at that time in Persia dominated the landscape. And so understandably, the notion that a prophet of God might be returning was very threatening to them. He's too young. He, he, he's not experienced. He's not, he doesn't know all the books the way we do. But behind that fear, what happens to us if the hidden imam returns? The whole edifice of Shi'i Islam changes. One of the letters of the living was a remarkable woman named Tahere. Against the draconian customs of the time, her father allowed her to be educated. She understood from the holy scriptures in the Quran that the 12th Imam was going to return. And she heard of something called the Sheikhis. In Karbala, she joined the Sheikhi community to learn more about the quest for the promised one. She had a dream where the Bab came to her and revealed a dissertation on a very specific theological point in the Quran. Months later, another disciple, Mullah Ali Bastami, came to Karbala to spread the word of the Bab. When Mullah Ali shared certain verses with Tahereh, she had a flash of sudden recognition. These are the exact verse he recited in my dream. She was given one of his writings that for her was a confirmation of that dream and that the Bab was the promised one prophesied. She had the depth of knowledge to recognize the Bab was actually claiming to be the revealer of the divine word. In other words, putting forward a claim equivalent to that of Muhammad of starting a new religious dispensation. So she had the spiritual depth to understand that, but also she had the courage to start openly proclaiming it. Tahere was the only female letter of the living and the only one not to have met the Bab personally. Upon receiving reports about the success of his disciples, the Bab was ready to take his unique and disruptive message to the holiest site in all of Islam, the shrine at Mecca in Arabia. This pilgrimage to Mecca, a holy journey called the Hajj, is one that all Muslims are asked to perform at least once in their lives. He set out on the voyage by sea with his disciple, Qudus. According to Shia Islam, the 12th Imam would actually go on pilgrimage to Mecca. And during that pilgrimage, he would then announce his new revelation. Pilgrims circle the sacred Kaaba seven times, speaking the words, Here I am, O Lord, here I am. The Bab did much more. Grasping the ring on the venerable shrine, he cried out to the encircling crowd, I am that promised one whose advent you have been awaiting. Then he said it again, I am that promised one whose advent you have been awaiting. And finally, I am that promised one whose advent you have been awaiting. 
Unfortunately, his proclamation was met with deaf ears. It was not acknowledged. The Bab then proclaimed his revelation in a letter to the Sharif, the highest ranking religious leader of Mecca. He and his message were ignored. After the pilgrimage, the Bab and Qudus left the Arabian Peninsula to make the long journey back. Along the way, the Bab told Qudus that they would never meet again. He said, yours will be the ineffable joy of quaffing the cup of martyrdom for his sake. I too shall tread the path of sacrifice and will join you in the realm of eternity. Despite being officially ignored at Mecca, the Bab's proclamation shook the very core of traditional beliefs, and this could not be ignored in Persia. It was politically disruptive to the clerics at that time to have a new religion appear and have beliefs like individual investigation of truth, which means that people hearing their sermons wouldn't simply believe them because they said so, but now have a spiritual obligation to independently read holy texts for themselves and make spiritual decisions using their own conscience. When Caduceus and other Babis publicly proclaimed the advent of the Bab, they were shaved, pierced, and paraded through the streets in humiliation, and then exiled. In Shiraz, the governor, Hussein Khan, called for the Bab's arrest as soon as he returned from his pilgrimage. Hussein Khan had ordered the capture of the Bab and sent out a group of soldiers. The Bab anticipated this, and seeing the soldiers in the distance, waited for them, and instead offered himself up. And as a result, the soldiers were so affected by the manner of the Bob that they allowed him to lead them out instead. At the governor's palace, Hussein Khan accused the Bob of being a disgrace to Islam. The Bob simply replied by quoting a verse from the Quran, warning against ignorance. This response enraged Hussein Khan. In a fury, he ordered one of his men to strike the Bab in the face. His blow sent his turban flying. And one of the highest ranking clergymen of the day actually picked up the turban and dusted it off and replaced it on the Bab's head. The Bab was placed under house arrest for most of the next year. But even unavailable to his followers, his message and fame continued to grow. And people from all over the kingdom began flocking to Shiraz to learn more about his teachings, hoping, praying for an opportunity to meet the Bab himself. The king of Persia, known as the Shah, was finally forced to pay attention. Proceeding cautiously, he sent Vahid, his most trusted scholar, to investigate the cause of the Bab. Vahid is well known for his knowledge. He was famous for having memorized 20,000 traditions of the prophets and of the Imams. Vahid made a solemn vow. If he found the Bab to be false, he would strike him down with the Shah's sword. If he found the Bab to be true, he would lay down his own life for him. And so Vahid came to Shiraz and set up an interview with the Bab. Initially, he was very arrogant. He considered himself infinitely superior to the Bab. But as the Bab started to reply to his questions and reveal the true extent of his own spiritual understanding, Vahid became more and more reflective and started thinking, I've underestimated this person. Vahid held a chapter of the Quran in his mind that without being asked to do so, the Bab would elucidate. And to his astonishment and shock, the Bab spontaneously delivered a commentary on that exact section. For the next five hours, he freely revealed the word of God without interruption or hesitation. Vahid is thunderstruck at the eloquence, 
at the speed at which the Bab is revealing these verses, the like of which he had never heard before. And he immediately recognizes the voice behind this commentary is none other than the voice behind the Quran itself. Vahid later wrote, if all the powers of the earth were allied against me, they would be powerless to shake my confidence in the greatness of his cause. Vahid was so won over by his experience with the Bab that he actually wrote the Shah and told the Shah that any of the disparaging comments that had been made about the Bab were absolutely false. And finally, he said, I myself am now a follower of the Bab. When the Shah received the message of his most trusted scholar, he reportedly told his prime minister, if Vahid is a Babi, we should stop belittling the cause of the Bab. However, the prime minister served in a sense as the Shah's spiritual guide. And Prime Minister Aghasi was very threatened by the claim of the Bab to being the promised one. And so the Shah's specific wishes were ignored. And Hussein Khan ordered that any person in Shiraz found in possession of the Bab's writings would face severe punishment. Yet the curious and the scholarly continued to seek out the Bab and his teachings, risking everything to meet him in person. Hussein Khan ordered a raid on the home of the Bab's uncle in an effort to capture what he thought would be a large group of the followers. However, when they arrived, they found that the only people that were there were the Bob, his uncle, and a friend. After arresting the three men, they were heading towards the prison, but were confronted with panic in the streets. Shiraz had been overwhelmed by a fierce cholera epidemic, and the population was terrified. The constable took his prisoners to his own home, where they discovered that the constable's son had contracted cholera and was on the verge of death. The anguished father begged the Bob to save his son. He instructed the constable to give his child water the Bob had used for his ritual washing before prayers. And to the constable's great relief, his boy recovered. Afterwards, the constable asked the governor to release the Bob, and he did so, on the condition that the Bob leave Shiraz forever. He was not given a moment to say goodbye to his mother or his wife. The Bab and Khadijah never saw one another again. In exile, the Bab decided to go north to Isfahan. When he arrived there in September 1846, the Bab contacted the governor of Isfahan, Manashir Khan, in the hope that he could convince the governor of his authenticity. He was a very important, powerful man, at the same time extremely loyal and trusted by the king. He was listened to by everybody except a small group of particularly obdurate clerics. He was from Christian background, so although he acted as a believer in Islam, in his heart, he really uh, was not yet truly uh, convinced. Manuchar Khan wanted to investigate the claims of the Bab, and so he held a number of meetings at which, of course, the clergy was present always. During one of these meetings, Manuchar Khan himself put a question to the Bab, and he said, could you find proof for the specific prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad. In less than two hours, the Bab wrote a lengthy treatise demonstrating that nothing about the life of Muhammad was accidental. Through this, he shows that revelation of divine verses through the Bab himself is a continuation of that same mission of the Prophet Muhammad. The treatise the Bab wrote that day was so masterful that the governor immediately declared that his faith in Muhammad was complete. He said, I testify to my belief in the Bab's superhuman knowledge and power, which no amount of learning can ever impart. Faced with the Bab's superiority 
his enemies realized the power they were up against was far greater than they had imagined. Instantly, they understood their inability to challenge the Bab, and so refused to engage with him that day. Manu Khan realized that because of the opposition now that was arising among the religious leaders, that the Bab's life was in danger. Manashir Khan became increasingly protective of the Bab and offered to donate his substantial wealth to further his cause. But the Bab refused this offer, saying his cause would triumph through the sacrifices of the poor and lowly. He intended to arrange for a meeting between the Shah and the Bab, because the Bab had been asking for this, and the Shah himself had also expressed his wish to meet with the Bab. But it was not to be. Manashir Khan passed away. The Bab's enemies had him arrested and sent to Tehran, the capital city, to face the highest authority in Persia, the Shah. But in Tehran, at the king's palace, the prime minister was deeply worried that the Shah would also fall under the sway of the Bab, thus diminishing his own power. And instead, Prime Minister Al-Rasid arranged for the Bab to be banished to the remote northwestern corners of Iran to a place called Maku, so that this meeting would never take place. It was hoped to isolate the Bab in this fortress and uh, in that way to cut off the Bab from, from his followers. But the long journey took the Bab through the city of Tabriz, and it was there reminiscent of the triumphant entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, that the streets were filled with the curious and the devoted alike, all cheering and struggling to catch a glimpse of the Bab. Even the soldiers who escorted him were reported to be visibly overcome with love. The Bab faced a solitary imprisonment at Maku, a fort surrounded by a huge rock that blocked out the sun. There, shadowy days stretched into long, dark nights. He was denied even a basic lamp for light. Yet he used this time to reveal hundreds of thousands of verses. Some of the most significant works of the Bab were revealed as he lay imprisoned in Maku, including the mother book of the Babi dispensation, the Persian Bayan. In these writings from prison, the Bab offered a radical reinterpretation of the Day of Resurrection. To the Muslims, it's very apocalyptic. It's the end times, it's judgment day, the dead arise from their graves, etc. The Bab taught that the Day of Resurrection was the day when a new messenger of God came, and it was the duty of all men to recognize this prophet. And the sad thing is that most Muslims missed out on the actual Day of Resurrection. The Bob's definition of resurrection was one of renewal, a time of change, a new revelation, a new truth. So this time of resurrection was one that should be celebrated. The Bob proclaimed that after him, very soon after him, would appear him whom God shall make manifest, a new divine emissary, a messenger, the Bob said, who would bring a revelation even more potent than the revelation that the Bob himself had brought. Although the prime minister was successful at distancing the Bob from his devoted followers, nothing could keep them from him. The hardened warden of Maku, gradually won over by the Bob, was becoming more lenient with his privileges. He allowed the Bab's followers free access to the Bab, and the whole point of the Bab being there, which was to isolate him, was completely lost because there was now a free flow of, of uh, people coming to the Bab and taking the writings of the Bab back to the rest of Iran. People would come to just hear his voice and the, the sweetness, the melody of his prayers. But back in Tehran, the Prime Minister was infuriated by his inability to suppress the Bab's growing movement or control his own warden. So he sent him to a prison in an even more severe location called Chirik. His plan was unsuccessful, as once again, 
the new warden was so moved by the Bob that he too discontinued the harsh condition the Prime Minister had commanded and allowed his followers, hungry for new teachings, to come to him. There was an embrace of modern ideas, such as giving women rights that did not exist in Persian society at the time. So for those who came to accept him and recognize him, this was a time of tremendous joy, tremendous gladness, because it was the fulfillment of their greatest wish to live at a time that witnessed the appearance of one whose expectation had been longed and yearned for for centuries. Up to that point, some of the Babis were still thinking that the Babi movement was just a reform movement within Islam, while others were fairly convinced that no, it was an independent revelation. So the Bab issued a call to all of his leading uh, disciples, wherever they were in the country, to come to a place called Badash. The Conference of Badash was a really significant period in the revelation of the Bab. While he himself was not present, this represented a chance or a time for those who followed him, his disciples, to independently carry the religion forward. The conference was attended by nearly all of the Bab's key disciples, including Tahereh and Mirza Hussein Ali, who would later play a much greater role in the movement when he became known as Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. The announced purpose was figuring out how to free the Bab from imprisonment. But the real purpose was to announce that the Babi faith was a revelation from God and to announce the annulment, therefore, of the previous revelation, which included the laws that Muhammad had revealed in the Quran. Because people were not ready, including even the elites of the Babi, this dramatic event, turning point, had to be presented with wisdom. So the leading disciples conceived of a plan that would gradually lead the entire conference to the conclusion that this was, in fact, a new religious dispensation. But even they were in for a shock. Tahare entered the tent, unveiled. It was absolutely shocking. It was a revolutionary act for a woman to reveal her face in the company of men. It was considered a sin just to look at a woman's shadow, and so to look at her face was considered an abomination. And for her to appear like that shook the faith of the people who were in the room. One man even tried to cut his throat. He was so alarmed by this happening. So even though they'd been led to the point of of accepting that this was a new revelation. They were not expecting it to be a complete break with the norms of, of their own culture. She was making a point that the equality of men and women was now a reality thanks to the teachings of the Bab, and we were no longer going to do things in the old manner. The Babi faith from that moment on was a distinct faith from Islam and abrogated the laws and the practices of Islam, following only then the laws and practices of the Bab. The public proclamation of a new religion was grounds for a charge of heresy. So, in July of 1848, the Bab was summoned to Tabriz to stand trial before a group of hostile clerics and the crown prince of Persia. They questioned the Bab about his teachings and admonished him to recant his claims. This was a mock trial. It was an attempt to ridicule and humiliate the Bob. The questions that were posed to him were entirely of a trivial nature. They had objections to the Bob's answers, and it became increasingly undignified as these clerics became more and more agitated and started abusing the Bob verbally. And then came the most important question of all, and his answer. Whom do you claim to be? And his response was, I am, I am, I am the promised one. I am the one whose name you have for a thousand years invoked. But they didn't believe him and demanded he perform a miracle. The Bab replied that he had already performed the same miracle as the Prophet Muhammad, 
the revelation of the Word of God. In their ruling, the clerics ordered that the Bab be subjected to a torture known as the bastinado, where the soles of the victim's feet would be violently beaten. The great irony of religious history is that the very first people to attack the new prophet are the followers of the old prophet, or let's say the clergy. Just weeks after the trial at Tabriz, the Shah of Persia died. Upheaval erupted across the kingdom. The Bab's followers were the most convenient scapegoats and were targeted by the prime minister as enemies of the state. In northern Persia, a group of Babis led by Mullah Hussein were severely harassed and some were murdered. Seeking to escape this persecution while observing the Bab's teaching of nonviolence, the beleaguered Babis petitioned the governor to provide safe passage out of town. The duplicitous governor agreed and sent a detachment of soldiers. But the Babis had been deceived. The soldiers turned on them and started shooting. Mullah Hussein led the Babis on a successful counterattack. The soldiers were beaten back, and the few surviving soldiers fled. Realizing that they would soon face a larger army, the Babis took shelter in a fort known as Sheikh Tabarsi. Battles were heroically fought in self-defense on the part of the Babis, and for several heroic months, the Babis withstood the onslaught of the forces that had gathered around them. The Shah's troops, even though there were many times the number of the Barbies, much better armed than the Barbies, seemed unable to take this makeshift fort that had been created by the Barbies. And you have Mullah Hussein, a famous scholar, you know, he studies the Quran and he probably weighs all of 97 pounds. And he's on a horse and he's got a sword. And it, there were dozens of witnesses to him chopping through a, a tree and a soldier and a musket with one blow. But Mullah Hussein was later killed when a bullet struck him in the chest. Yet the Babis continued to hold out for months, frustrating the king's army. It was only out of a scheme that the commanders plotted that they were able to subdue the Babis. They swore on the Quran that they would not harm the Babis were they to surrender. The Babis realized it was a trick, but surrendered anyway out of reverence for the Quran. The commander attacked them, killed many of them and captured other ones, and all the ones that were captured were also eventually put to death. Caduce was one of the few survivors of the Fort Tabarsi massacre. His story is a brutal example of the cruelty of those who opposed the new faith. Stripped of his clothes and chained, he was paraded through the streets in an eerie reenactment of the Passion of the Christ. The howling mob shouted curses and spat upon him. Finally, his body was pierced, mutilated, and burned. Still imprisoned in Cherik, the Bab was overcome with grief as he learned the fate of his faithful followers. When he emerged from his grief, he resumed his writings, urging his followers to prepare for him whom God shall make manifest. In the summer of 1850, the Prime Minister of Persia ordered that the Bab be brought to Tabriz for public execution by firing squad. Along with the Bab was his companion, a young man by the name of Anis, who had asked to be with the Bab and to face the uh, soldiers uh, during this execution. The captain of the regiment assigned to carry out the execution was an Armenian Christian named Sam Khan. He had heard of the Bab and was deeply conflicted about carrying out his orders for fear of angering God himself over killing an innocent man. 
Sam Khan approached the Bab in the prison and stated that he harbored no ill will towards the Bab or his message, but that he was simply following orders. The Bab comforted Sam Khan and he said that if your intentions are pure and what you say is true, rest assured that God will relieve you of this great burden that you carry. With this advice, Sam Khan decided he would move forward. And the guards came for the Bob, and he said, I'm not finished dictating my final instructions to my secretary. A very uncouth soldier said, the time has come, you must come now, it is time for your execution. The Bob said, no power on earth can prevent me from finishing this final task. The guard ignored the Bob's warning and led him to the public square. There, he and his young follower, Anis, were suspended with ropes against a pillar. Thousands of people had gathered to witness the execution of the Bob. There were people on rooftops. There were dignitaries, there were journalists, and people from every walk of life. Because it was a big thing, uh, they were killing a descendant of the Prophet. A firing squad of 750 soldiers from the king's army moved into position. To show the majesty of a state and also the fear of the government, they thought that the Babis might engage in an armed insurrection. Aim. The order was given. Fire! The soldiers fired. The smoke from their hundreds of guns filled the square. And when that smoke cleared, Anis stood unharmed, smiling, and the Bob had vanished. The people were absolutely astonished. They could not believe their eyes. They were filled with fear and awe. What had happened? How could 750 rifles have missed? And yet, the Bob was gone from sight. So there was this quick search to find, find where did the Bob go to? And they found him back in the room inside the prison, speaking to his amanuensis, his secretary. The Bob turned to them and said, now that I have concluded, you may do with me as you wish. Meanwhile, Sam Khan told his regiment of Christian Armenian soldiers, that's it. We've done our job once, we're not gonna do it again, and he left. A second regiment was assembled to execute the Bob. As the Bob was suspended for a second time against the pillar with the knees, he spoke his final words to the multitude. Had you believed in me, O wayward generation, every one of you would have followed the example of this youth. The day will come when you will have recognized me. That day I shall have ceased to be with you. At that point, the command was given again for the soldiers to shoot, and the Bob and his companion were executed. The Bob's body was shattered by the bullets, except for his face, which mysteriously remained untouched. At that moment, reminiscent of the crucifixion of Jesus, a powerful storm descended upon Tabriz. Dust darkened the sky until it appeared to be night at midday. There are many accounts of what happened that day, including from government sources. They differ in some details, but the one fact on which they all agree is that the first volley fired by the Christian regiment missed the Bob completely. The Bob consistently rejected their miracles as the proof of the truth of the prophet of God. But the Bob goes further than this. He forbids his followers to attribute any miracle to him. And therefore, the final event in the life of the Bob is not defined as a miraculous event, yet there is really no plausible explanations for that. And therefore, it remains a mysterious event 
in the sacred history of the world. After the Bab's martyrdom, his enemies attempted one final humiliation. His remains were thrown next to the moat outside the city wall to be eaten by animals. But his followers were able to steal them away in the middle of the night. His remains were kept hidden for 59 years. But in 1852, two years after the martyrdom of the Bab, a group of Babis, still reeling from the murder of their prophet, attempted to assassinate the Shah of Persia. The plan was bungled. The Shah survived. The new prime minister ordered an all-out assault against the Babis, killing thousands. Tahereh was also arrested and confined in Tehran, where she received a letter from the young Shah. He wanted her to desert the cause of the Bab. Become a traditional Muslim again, he offered, and I will marry you. Then you will have all that you desire. But Tahereh rejected the Shah's proposal. She had a dream about the fact that she was executed. She then began to fast and she began to pray. When they came, Tahereh somehow knew they were coming. She perfumed herself and she dressed herself in her wedding gown for her execution. Tahereh's last reported words were, you can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. By late 1852, the cause of the Bab was teetering on the brink of extinction with only one leader left alive, Baha'u'llah. He was tortured and thrown into the horrible Tehran prison known as the Black Pit. It was here that Baha'u'llah and the company of other Babis received the first intimations of his mission when a maiden appeared to him and he realized that he was the one whom the Bab had foretold as him whom God shall make manifest. He describes the experience as being like a cascade of uh, waterfall flowing down over him, sort of divine revelation flowing down upon him. In 1863, Baha'u'llah publicly declared that he was him whom God shall make manifest, the fulfillment of the Bab's mission, the promised one for all faiths. He suffered years of persecution and exile, finally bringing him to the Holy Land, Israel. So Baha'u'llah essentially expanded the blueprint that the Bab had laid down, calling for the harmony of all humanity, elimination of racism, elimination of sexism, elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty, essentially fulfilling the goal for which the Bab had laid down his life. Baha'u'llah instructed that the Bab's remains be brought here, to Haifa, where a shrine for him was constructed. Today, the earthly remains of the Bab rest under a stately golden dome, bathed in the light he was so callously denied during his brief ministry.